Polycarp was the Bishop of Smyrna. Smyrna is located in uh, today Izmir, which is on the coast of Turkey. And Polycarp was a first century, second century uh, believer, very well respected uh, father of the church in this area. He was a bishop over Smyrna um, and a great man of integrity. And he was martyred in his 80s. He was 86 years old. When he was brought to the stadium in which he was charged to recant his faith, um, he was very winsome in doing so. He had a he had a great sense that the Lord was with him. He was hearing the Lord speaking to him to be strong, to be a man, in fact. And he he was called to recant his atheism. Now, atheism meaning that Christians were known as people who didn't have any idols to worship. They didn't have any gods in their houses uh, like everybody else did. Everybody else had a god or a, an idol and and Christians didn't because we believe that God is spirit and we don't believe in worshiping idols. Well, they looked at that and said, you must be atheist. You must not believe in God if you don't have any idols. And so they called Polycarp to recant his atheism. And <laughs> he said, he waved to his accusers and said, oh, way with you atheists. <laughs> and then he said this, 86 years I have served him and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The proconsul who was addressing him said, I have wild animals. I'll throw you to them unless you change your mind. And Polycarp replied, call them in, for we're not allowed to change from something better to something worse. Scorn the wild beasts, the, the proconsul said, and I'll have you burned alive if you don't change your mind. And Polycarp said, you threaten with fire that burns for a short time and is soon quenched. You don't know about the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment that awaits the wicked. But why are you waiting? Come, do what you will. So when they lit the fire, the funeral pyre, it was all ready. Polycarp took, out his, took off his outer clothes. He unfastened his belt and he uh, took, off of his, took off his shoes. They began to pile the wood around him and they were going to nail him to the stake as well. But Polycarp said, nope, leave me the way I am. He who gives me power to endure the fire will help me to remain in the flames without moving, even without being secured by nails. And this is how Polycarp died and went to be with the Lord. It's remarkable, isn't it? Very winsome, very powerful testimony of, of being faithful through persecution. And this is the running theme that the Lord has for his church. As we look at the seven messages that Jesus has for his church, he's saying, be faithful, be faithful in persecution, be faithful and overcome. This is his message to the church. We're looking at two churches today, Smyrna and Pergamum, and both of them faced persecution. They both faced pressure. And the question that we have for us today is, how do we respond to pressure? How do we respond by faith to pressure that's around us? When we look at the way that the world responds to pressure, or even your friends, think of your friends, you know, how your friends respond to pressure. How do they respond to pressure? Some immerse themselves in their work. Sometimes work is actually the thing that alleviates the pressure they might feel at home or in other things in their life. Or they might look for false satisfaction in pornography. Or they might find themselves drinking away their problems in alcohol or, or binge note Netflix or throw themselves into social media and technology, all of these different ways that our friends will try to deal with pressure, the pressure that they feel today. Well, how do we respond by faith to pressure? I think the messages that Jesus gives to his, these two churches, Smyrna and Pergamon will be helpful for us. Look at Smyrna. 
follows this pattern. There's always an angel to the church. Remember, there's an angel for the church over every location. We have an angel who is a messenger of God, who guards us, who protects us, leads us into God's will. So he speaks to the angel, transmit this to the church in Smyrna. And when we look at verse 9, it says, Jesus says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. Now, let's get some context for this. What are the afflictions and poverty that Smyrna is dealing with? These followers of Jesus, as as this message says, are being slandered by Jews. They're being slandered by Jews because the Jewish people had enjoyed a certain kind of immunity from the Roman Empire. They were allowed to go ahead and do their uh, practices, their Jewish practices, to follow their laws. Um, They could offer sacrifice to the emperor, but to do so without declaring the emperor to be God. So the Jews were giving, given a certain level of immunity. But what happened when Nero, the emperor, came is that he singled out the Christians, the followers of Jesus, and said, You're, I'm going to treat you differently because the Christians were kind of under the subset of the Jews and given also some immunity until Nero. Nero went after the Christians, and many people, as we've said, up to 40,000 Christians died under Nero. Now, when we look at the Jews, they're saying, whoa, whoa, we're not with them, right? We're not like the Christians. And so the Jews would slander the Christians and go to the Roman police and say, "Uh, you know that these Christians, they're not offering any sacrifices to the emperor. You know that, right? And you know that they're not real Jews. They're not really part of us, right? And so they would slander these Christians and throw them under the bus. Why? To separate themselves from persecution so they can keep their own immunity. And what happened was the Christians would then have to face a lot of marginalization, a lot of uh, being ostracized out of the marketplace. They would lose their jobs. They wouldn't be given opportunities to to advance in the marketplace and they would even lose their homes and some would die. All right. So this is how the, the Christians at the time were now facing financial poverty, all right, because they were being slandered. So this is what, what the Jesus is looking at. And he says, look, I know your afflictions. I know, I know what you're going through. And he, he looks at those Jews who are, who are doing what they're doing and slandering and accusing these Christians falsely. And he's saying, you know what they are? They're a synagogue of Satan. Because if we know the word Satan, Satan literally means one who accuses. So Jesus is saying, I know your affliction. I know who's causing it. They are from Satan. Now, remember what what this whole book is, is about. It's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. What Jesus is doing here is he's revealing to them, here are the unseen forces at work behind your suffering. When you're suffering, you know who's behind it? The mastermind is Satan himself. The accuser is fueling the accusations of those Jewish people. Now, we're not saying at all, and and the writer here is not saying, that Jewish people in general are all slanderers. That's not what we're saying. God's heart is for the Jewish people, but these particular Jews, they are acting as instruments of the accuser, Satan. So the pressure that the Christians are facing at this time is to compromise their faith for comfort. If they would just acquiesce and start to offer sacrifices to the emperor and do what a good Roman citizen would do, then life would be easier. They would be able to enjoy the the privileges they once had as the Jewish people had. They could be part of the marketplace. They could have jobs. They can get their houses. They could do all those things that allow for them to live the Roman dream. Okay. That would be easy. All they'd have to do is just accommodate compromise their faith. Now, how does Jesus respond? Uh, He says, look, I know your affliction. 
Your translations might say tribulation. The Greek word for that is thlipsis. Thlipsis literally means crushing pressure. I know your crushing pressure. But as we know, Jesus has said to his people, look, part of the Christian life is that you need to expect tribulation, right? In this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So he's not saying you're not going to have tribulation. He is saying you are going to have tribulation. But here's the thing. I've overcome. I've overcome the world. Daryl Johnson, who, who writes a wonderful commentary on, on Revelation, he says this about thlipsis. Thlipsis, that word for tribulation or, or suffering. He says this, thlipsis is the pressure experienced as the kingdom of God comes up against the kingdom of human beings in rebellion against God. That's why there's thlipsis. He goes on, Thlipsis is the pressure experienced along the line where kingdoms clash, along the line where the kingdom of light clashes with the kingdom of darkness, along the line where the reign of justice clashes with the reign of injustice, along the line where the rule of life clashes with the rule of death. That's where Christians live. They live on that line where there's a conflict of kingdoms. And in that conflict, there is flipsis, there is tribulation, there is testing. So Jesus is saying, if you look at what Jesus says, he's, he's saying, I know your flipsis. I know the crushing pressure that you're under. And then he says this, yet you are rich. You are rich. I know your afflictions, I know your poverty, but you need to know something. You are rich. You are rich. Why? Because they're standing firm. They're faithful to Jesus. And as they stay faithful to Jesus under the crushing pressure, we know that faith refined by pressure leads to stronger faith. And that stronger faith Jesus is saying, you are rich because you are spiritually strong. Whenever we stay faithful to Jesus, we get stronger because in the midst of that, Jesus gives us his perseverance. The same pers perseverance that Jesus had that led him to the cross to die for us is the same perseverance that he gives to you and to me when we are willing to stay faithful under the pressure. This is what Jesus sees in this little church. Now, people ask me all the time, and they may ask you, how's your church? When they're asking, how's New Life Church? What they're usually asking is, how's the financial giving going? Uh, how many people are showing up? Um, how many programs are going on? That's what they're usually asking about our church, right? So it's, you know, your budget, your dollars, you know, how many people are, are in attendance, all those things, right? And I know those things as they're, but I'm always like in a conflict of how I answer that. There's what they want to know. And then there's, how does Jesus, how would Jesus answer that question? And what's more important? <laughs> it's how Jesus would answer that question. When you look at, when you look at New Life Church, you might say, well, you know, we don't have a lot of resources. We're probably a little understaffed. We don't have a lot of people. Okay, but what would Jesus say? Would Jesus look at you and look at me, New Life Church, and say, yeah, you might say all those things, but let me tell you, I know what you're going through, and you are rich. You are spiritually rich because your faith is strong under pressure. When your faith is strong under pressure, you're... I am giving you the perseverance that you need. That's what's making you strong. See, we can't assess ourselves based on what the world says. Um, if you saw the email that I was about that I, I sent out yesterday for New Life, then you'll know that there's a pastoral review coming up in a couple of, of weeks. That's where they look at me. They look at the relationship of me and the church. And sometimes the assessments go along the lines of, well, what's the plan? 
and how many people have come to your church and all of those things, right? And I kind of chafe a little bit sometimes when those are the measurements, because in my mind, I'm thinking, how would Jesus look at the church? And what Jesus would look at is, how's your faith? How's your hope? And how's your love? Those are always the measures of the church in the New Testament. How's your faith? How's your hope? How's your love? And those things usually get refined under pressure. You usually can see those things under pressure. How are people responding to the pandemic? How are people responding to crisis or sickness or illness or any of those circumstances? How are they responding? Is it by faith and hope and love? That's what Jesus is looking at. So he says to the church, when he's seeing a church under pressure, he's saying to them, here's what I want you to know. I know you're suffering, and I know the way to overcome it. I know you're suffering, and I know the way to overcome it. This church had been doing that. If you notice, Smyrna, they don't get any criticism from Jesus at all. It's one of the two churches of the seven that don't get any criticism. Why? Because they're staying faithful under pressure. And, th- and what Jesus is saying to them is, one, I know you're suffering, and I know the way to overcome. You ever, you ever go through, you know, trying to be faithful in your school? If you're a student, if you were or in college, you might have heard a professor you know, criticize Christianity, or they, I remember sitting in a political science class and the professor was just mocking the whole idea of natural law. The natural law is is something that is God given and it's understood as what makes the world go around. And just that kind of rejection. And then, you know, being a zoology major in Davis, evolution is a big deal. And so there would be some mocking about of a Christian worldview, that God would create the world. And so what do you do as a Christian? You can say, well, I, I, I you know, you, you know I, I don't know if I agree, you know, or compromise or give what the professor wants you to say. In fact, I remember, you know, there was an environmental law um, class in which I was asked on the exam in Genesis, when God says, be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion over the earth, write about how that is justification for ruining the environment. (laughs) I had an option at that point. If I wanted to get an A on that exam, I was going to say, you're exactly right. This is how Christians have ruined the environment justified by this verse. I chose not to, and I got a C. <laughs> okay, but those that's a minor example of decisions that all of us have to make all the time. Your friends are going to have views about gender and sexuality, and they're going to assume that you're going to accept the secular view of that, right? What do you do? Do you stay steadfast to what the scriptures have said, what God has designed in us as human beings? Or if you're going to be... Um, just in your own workplace, you're you're invited to go to this party and and you know get hammered. We're all going to get drunk over the weekend because that's what the weekend's for, and you're invited to be part of that. What do you say? What do you do? How do you how do you toe the line? Now, if you've been faithful in all of those situations and following Jesus, you might get to a point where you are saying, "Lord, you know I've been faithful," but do you know? Do you know what I have to go through? Do you know the pressure that I have to feel? Do you know what it's costing me? You ever ask that? You ever ask the Lord that? Lord, do you really know what I'm going through here? What does Jesus say? I know. I know your afflictions. I know your poverty. Yet, you are rich. You are rich. We need to hear that. You are rich. We also need to hear Jesus say, I have the way to overcome too. Because when it's tempting to compromise in order to be more comfortable, in order to be a little bit more uh, just privileged, we can enjoy the privileges of being around our workplace and coworkers and social acceptance. That's just more comfortable. When we are faced with that temptation, we need to hear Jesus say, hey, listen, I know, I know, and I have the way to overcome. I have the way to overcome. 
So Jesus is saying that. When he looks at, at this church at Smyrna, you, you see back in verse 8 how he started. Remember how he, when, whenever Jesus starts a message, he's always drawing from that vision from chapter 1 and, and drawing a personality trait from chapter 1. And, and he draws it into the message to the church that's just right for their situation. And what Jesus draws from that initial vision here is that he says this, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. Why does Jesus reference that? Because he wants this church to know, I am the author and the finisher of your faith. I'm the one who came, I suffered, and I overcame. I'm the pioneer of your faith. So watch me, and I'll show you how to get through this. And if you get through the suffering, if you get through the pressure, you'll get to the other side. You will overcome, just as Jesus endured the cross and then overcame. Jesus is saying, I'm with you. I know what you're going through. I'll walk you through it because I've been through it, and I'll get you to the other side. We need to know that. We need to know when we're tempted to move into comfort because sometimes we don't know the path forward. We need to know, wait, there is a path forward. Jesus paved that path and he paved it so I could walk on it with him in the midst of that. So first of all, just know, Jesus knows. He knows your suffering. He knows the crushing pressure you're feeling and he knows the temptation it is to choose comfort instead of suffering. I mean, how many of us, if we had the option between suffering and comfort, are we choosing suffering, <laughs> right? None of us willingly say, oh yeah, I'll suffer unless you're a masochist, right? But if you say, Jesus, you show me the way through suffering, I will follow you. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that to them. I remember when my dad had a very difficult um, departure from a church, and I was about 10 years old. It was a large church here in the city, and he was having a farewell service. And I remember it vividly as a 10-year-old sitting in the pew. And back in the day, that's when pastors would sit on a stage. Remember that? So they would sit on a stage on their chairs. And, and as I saw my dad in his farewell service, having gone through a lot of, a lot of pain um, that led to that day, I saw him there and then and the, he had requested that a soloist would sing the song, Through It All, Andre Crouch. You guys know that one? Yes. Through it all, through it all, right? I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. As she's singing that, my dad's crying on the stage. It's like one of three times I've ever seen him cry, right? But I know that what's happening in that moment is the reality that Jesus is with him through it all, even in that moment, and will bring him through it all. That was the reality that, that he understood as he was feeling really beat up in that moment. That's what Jesus is saying to his church. I'm with you through it all, and I'll get you through it all. Follow me. We'll get to the other side, and you'll overcome, all right? Number two, the church at Pergamum. They faced a different kind of a pressure, but similar. Um, it was a pressure to compromise in order to be liked, really. Likeability, to be accepted by those who just reject God's authority. Here's what he says to the church in verse 13. He says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Whoa. Okay, so Satan had a synagogue in Smyrna, but here's Satan's throne in Pergamum. And again, this is Pergamum, a, play, a city in what we call today Turkey. And what we have in, Tur in Pergamum is their claim to fame. They were the first city to build a temple to the emperor in the Roman Empire. And they were proud of it. 
the first, first city to build a temple. They were also the center of worship for Asclepius, who's the god of healing, symbolized by a snake. It was also just behind Pergamum that there was this hill full of pagan temples, one of which was shaped in the house of Zeus. So lots of pagan worship happening here. And so this could be why Jesus is saying this is really the throne of Satan himself, which leads to a, a really good question. How does a city today become a throne of Satan? We don't have time to get into that one. But how does a city today become a throne of Satan? I mean, if you go around the country, people kind of think San Francisco, I think that's a throne of Satan, that, right? You, you hear about that. But really thinking that through, what makes a city become a throne of Satan? At the very least, we need to understand there are spiritual rulers and principalities that are at work in our city. Whether you want to call it the throne of Satan or not, we have to understand that that's a reality behind the pressure and the persecution. So Jesus gives his assessment to the church at Pergamum. First, a commendation, and he says, you've been faithful in how you've publicly put yourself out there to identify with me. This church at Pergamum has been out there and have not denied their faith in Jesus when they were pressured to do so. But here's where they have been faulted. And I, and I love that Jesus started with a commendation before he gets to the correction. And here's the correction. While they've resisted the temptation to deny Jesus publicly, they've accommodated some of the practices of the pagan worship. They've accommodated some of the idolatry that was going on around them. So, then he cites Balaam. If you remember, Balaam has been cited here. If you know the Old Testament story, you're always going to think Balaam and the donkey. Balaam and the donkey, right? And Balaam was this corrupt man um, who was giving all the wrong advice to the people of Israel and telling them to compromise, to adopt some of the pagan rituals and go ahead and intermarry with some of the pagan peoples. And what was happening? Ba Balaam was urging the people of Israel to compromise, to accommodate. Why? So we can just all get along. Let, let Moab kind of think a little more highly of you. Don't be so exclusive. Be more inclusive. Now, where do we see that today? I think today we see that when we adopt a false teaching or a, we water down the gospel in order to make Jesus a little more likable to the world outside, right? I remember when, uh, and I don't usually do this, but I'm going to name his name. Rob Bell came out with a book called Love Wins. And when, he was, when that book came out, he was advocating a couple of things. One that God wouldn't really judge anyone for their sin, that everyone really has access to heaven. And number two, he was saying, so therefore there can't really be a hell or a judgment. And number three, he was saying, sacrifice for sins, that's really an antiquated medieval kind of way of thinking. Well, we're progressive now. We're past that. We're more enlightened. And so what was Rob Bell doing? He was saying, you know, I know a lot of people in the world who think of Christians as too judgmental, and they present a Jesus who's like a judge instead of compassionate and merciful and all those things. And so what Rob was doing was he was saying, let's take the posture of the world and say, well, maybe we're wrong. Maybe we're wrong. We need to make Jesus more accessible to the world. So the intent behind it is not so bad. He's trying to make Jesus more accessible. The problem is it's no longer Jesus. If you, if you take away the judgment of Jesus, then it's no longer Jesus. Is Jesus full of compassion and merciful and kind? Yes. Do we need to go to the world and lead with that? Yes. So should we look at the way that we message the gospel and say, do we lead with judgment or compassion? Yes, we should. 
But anytime we remove any characteristic of Jesus for the sake of making him more palatable, it's no longer Jesus. No longer Jesus. And this is the temptation that we all have. We might want to water down the message of uh, of judgment because we don't want people to feel like they're sinners. Sinners don't want to feel like sinners either, right? I mean, none of us really enjoy that label, but it's the truth. Here's the thing. If you want to know the love of Jesus, you've got to accept one thing, that where you stand before God is that you stand condemned. You don't need me to tell you that. You already know that. You already know if you stand before a holy God, you're not worthy to be part of his kingdom. You're not worthy to enter into his heaven. That's just a, you just know that. And people who try to reject that can't run away from that latent guilt and shame that they're carrying around with them. That guilt and shame that comes from knowing, I cannot stand before a holy God. So when we say to people, yes, part of the message here is that God loves you. God loves you. We lead with that, right? God loves you. But second, you're a sinner. You are loved more than you can imagine, but you're actually more sinful than you can imagine too. And, and we don't leave them there, right? We say, here's where love and justice meet at the cross. At the cross, we see the love and justice of God, where God in his love sends Jesus to die the death that you deserved. So that's where we see love and justice meeting together so that we can take on the beauty and love of Jesus without the judgment because Jesus took it for us. That's the full message. Now, is everyone going to want to hear that? They may not. Once you get to to that point about them being sinners before a holy God, that's where they might check out. That's where they might resist. That's where they might label you, stereotype you, all of those things. They might just say, that's why I don't like Christians, okay? But if that's where they go, that's where they go, right? Again, I'm not saying we should lead with that. That's not the point. We should lead with God loves you. God loves you, but the reality of God's love only comes to anyone who acknowledges their sinfulness. The only people who can really truly experience that unconditional love of God the Father are those who are willing to be honest about themselves as they stand before God as sinners and can acknowledge that Jesus went to the cross for my sin. Anything that we do to water that down, we're presenting some other Jesus. Okay? We're tempted to do that when we want Jesus to be more likable. And we, we want to be more likable. But we have to ask ourselves, is, really, is that the loving thing to do? That's not. It's not the loving thing to do. It's actually worse. It's worse. It's actually indifference. Because we're caring more about us being liked and Jesus being liked than what's good for that person. Right? So that's the temptation. The temptation is... Let's water down Jesus. Let's be more likable. And that's where we get into false teaching. And that's, that's part of the criticism Jesus had about the Pergamum church. They were adopting Balaam's techniques. They were adopting, and the Nicolaitans, they were just like Balaam. That's all that is. They were just saying, hey, let's just adopt a little bit of pagan practices into our Christian practices so that we can all just get along. That's not the message of the gospel. So that when the temptation's there, what does Jesus say? He wants us to know two things. Remember how he started. He said in verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. You remember the sharp double-edged sword from chapter 1? That was part of the vision. What did it represent? This vision of the Son of Man with a sharp double-edged sword coming out of his mouth we said, to the, we said that that's not a long, like, fighting sword. It's more of a surgical knife. It, it represents the piercing word of God. And, and what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to take out this 
surgical knife in order to refine your faith. I'm going to purify your faith. So I'm going to cut out the things that are wrong in your understanding of me. I'm going to cut out the false affections you have for the world. I'm going to cut those things out. It's just like Hebrews 4, 12 to 13. If you, if you, would, just, if you would just hear this. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's what Jesus wants to do for us. When we find ourselves saying, I want to I wanna kind of be more palatable and likable, that's where we're starting to need, we need God's word to truly examine why it is that we want that when we already have the absolute love of God. When we are already loved and accepted through the cross and resurrection of Jesus, why do we care so much about gaining significance to the world if we already have all the significance we need. That's where the word of God comes in and sorts out, where are you finding your significance? Where are you trying to gain acceptance when you already have it from God? The word of God is what allows us to see those false exception, uh, ex, that false acceptance from other people rather than from God. So what we need is we need to let the word of God do its work. Let the word of God search our hearts. Let the word of God transform us, renew our minds with the word of God so that we can then be transformed. That's what we need. That's Romans 12, right? One and two. So Jesus is ready to take out his knife on the church, his own church. Why? Because he wants to make us holy. He wants our faith and our knowledge of Jesus to be pure. And so his word is going to help us to do that. So will we humble ourselves under his word and say, Lord, whatever it is that you want to change in me, go ahead. I'm, I'm wide open. I'm out on the surgical table. Cut me open. Make me more like you. Make me holy. And the power of his word does that. That's the first thing. When we're tempted to compromise to be liked, we need the word of God to search us and shape us. The second thing is we need to remember where our future reward really is. Our future reward. What does Jesus say? He's saying for those who stay faithful and overcome, here's what happens on the other side. There will be hidden manna. There will be a white stone and I'll give you a new name. We don't have time to get into all of that, except there is this hidden manna, and I think it is the food that will be there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is this food that's yet to be revealed. Now remember, this is Revelation, so Jesus is revealing to us that there is going to be food. How about that? Now, you, I start imagining what that would look like. I start thinking there's going to be this big vat of dark chocolate that just flows. You know, there's going to be this something there. There's going to be some manna, some, some sort of food. It's going to be so good. So he's revealing that much, but he's not telling us what it is exactly. But he is telling us there will be a feast. The second thing he says is there's this white stone that he's going to give us. We don't know exactly what that means, but the best interpretation I've found on that is that when you would go into a concert or uh, uh, go into a stadium, you would be given, instead of like a ticket or a bracelet, you'd be given a white stone. A white stone would say, you have admission here. You can come and participate in what happens in this event. And this is what Jesus will give to everybody who overcomes. Here's your white stone. You belong here in this feast, in this kingdom. And then he says, I'm going to give you a new name. I'm going to give a new name. Now, if we look at the scriptures, whenever God gave a new name, remember, who did he give new names to? There's Jacob. Jacob, he renamed Israel, right? Whenever he renames, he's giving a new status, a new status to who you are. When we come into the kingdom of God, I'm going to come in as Jeff. 
but I'm going to be coming in as one who is now going to co-reign with Jesus in his kingdom. That means I have a new status. I have a new job. I hope I'm leading worship. I, I hope I would love to continue to lead worship into eternity. Yes, just imagine that. You are going to be given a new job in the presence of God for the kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. And so you will get a new status, a new name that goes with it. When you start thinking about this, the hidden manna, the white stone, the new name, all of a sudden you have a reward that is awaiting you and you don't have to try to get the reward of being liked by everybody around you at that point. You see the point? Jesus is shifting our focus future so that we don't get tempted to, to settle for lesser rewards in this, in this time. You see, you see what Jesus is doing? That's what Jesus gives to us. He says, I'm giving you my word. Let my word sort out your faith so that it's pure and holy. But I'm also giving you a reward on the other side. That's where we're going to so live. That's where life really is. Eternal life forever and ever. So let's recap and ask a few questions. Thinking of Smyrna, thinking of per Pergamum. Under what circumstances could you see yourself choosing material riches over spiritual riches? At what point do you get tempted to no longer stay faithful to Jesus for the sake of comfort and material riches? When you go through whatever suffering or pressure you go through, just know Jesus knows. Jesus knows, and he has a way to get, overcome it. So when you're in that moment where you're, you're thinking, oh, these are the circumstances, this is how I'm tempted, at that moment, hear Jesus say, I know. I know what you're going through, and I'll show you the way through it, and you will overcome. Second question is, what kind of spiritual compromises are we tempted to make in order to make Jesus more likable? In what ways do we compromise or are tempted to compromise in order to make Jesus and ourselves more likable to those around us? And Jesus says, allow my word to search your heart and then allow my future reward to give you all the satisfaction and hope that you need to deal with those temptations because there's nothing better than the feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb at the end. For those who overcome, there's a feast awaiting for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, all of us, all of us are dealing with certain kinds of pressure, pressures to remain faithful in a workplace that may be hostile to you or among friends or family. Whenever maybe we get back into family gatherings, that's when we hear people who become cynical about our faith. Lord, we pray that in those moments you would allow us to stay true, to stay faithful, and to trust, Lord, that you are with us in the midst of it. Help us never forget that. And Lord, continue to give us perseverance, the same perseverance that you had when you went to the cross and to the other side. Lord, give us that perseverance as we stay faithful to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.